Thank you all for this opportunity to be able to present to you on teaching and learning, uh, specifically on uh, some elements that Scott mentioned that we were going to discuss. Um, I've added one topic in there that I feel like is extremely relevant for you to know about. We're going to talk uh, on a high level about state assessment, the essay accountability reports, and digital equity data, because these are all pieces that I feel like school board members should have a, a general knowledge understanding of um, as we continue in this school year. So from the state assessment lens, we're going to talk specifically about ACT Aspire. And with that, we're going to go in a little bit, I kind of hide our faces over here. With that, we're going to go in a little bit into the state grade level performance from this past year and ACT Aspire updates. So in front of me, you'll see a chart on your screen that provides you kind of a broad picture overview of ACT Aspire over five years. And I just want to put into context that you're looking at reading performance here by grade level across the bottom, each little batch of uh, columns indicate a different grade level. And if you remember, ACT Aspire is a grade three through 10 assessment. So we have five years in there, but we wanna remember that we also skipped a year. We did not have a summative assessment during 20, the 1920 school year due to the release of school. And so I've put them all together to look at it over time as trends, but I do wanna be mindful that there is a year that we skipped without a summative assessment. And this is through the lens of reading. So with it, I just kinda of wanna give you a high level overview. When you look at the charts, you see the percentage of students at each grade level across the state performing at or above the proficient level in reading across five tested years. So this is about proficiency. This is about what we coined the term grade level performance. The data appears to show the greatest decreases in, <clears throat> in state reading performance to be at grades three and five. So if you look over here, this turquoise column represents this past year. And this first batch of data and chart columns here represents grade three. Over here is grade five. So when you first look at this, it looks like the greatest decreases in state reading formants is at grades three and five. And this data can be very, very useful to you as you make it a comparison to see if your local students outperform state average performance at a particular grade level or all grade levels, or if your students fell short of state level performance. It also helps put into perspective the impact of COVID and remote instruction on student learning in comparison with the performance of a larger population of students across the state. So it gives us a perspective to look at. It gives us something relative. Now let's look at this data using a different visualization tool. It's the same data that I built those charts from, but I've placed it in a chart listed the grade levels, grade levels down the left side and the years across the top with that gap not represented here for 1920. If a student tested this past year, they had a gap year prior to that without an assessment score. So they actually have um, a little bit different way of looking at this. So I wanna show you something that actually is kind of different when you present it. When you look at the cohort, we call it a grade level, a cohort. When you look at cohort performance across tested years and you factor in that skip test year of 2020 for all students, this is for all students, you actually see that the cohort group of students that had the greatest change in percentage points on reading were 10th graders last year. Look over here in the right column. All I did was look at the 10th graders that tested last year with a 30.7 they wouldn't have tested as ninth graders. So the last time they would have tested would have been in the eighth grade. So we don't have a ninth grade score on, we had an eighth grade score on them and we have a 10th grade score. So when you, when you calculate that difference and that change in percentage points, you see a little bit different picture of your data when you're looking at that through this type of visualization piece. So I just wanted you to be mindful of that the data from 2021 is baseline data at the other end of the spectrum for grade three and for grade four because they don't have any data before them prior to this year. We don't start the ACT Aspire until grade three. So now let's take a look at math performance. 
And I do want to say at any point in time, anybody that has a question uh, wants to ask that, I'm good with that. You, you feel free to ask as we move on. But that looks a little bit different now when you look at it through that lens and you look at how the students progressed, even with that gap in there in reading. Now let's look at math. Just like in reading, this is math performance um, across the years with the gap year uh, not represented in there, but five years of trend data across the state in math with the grade levels of third through 10th going across the bottom. Just like in reading, the data appears to show the greatest decreases or drop in state math performance to be at grades three and five. Do you notice when you look at this graph, any additional differing trends in grade level performance when you examine math? State average performance in mathematics, if you look at this, has historically trended downward after grade six, even prior to the pandemic. Look at this trend that we see across time, even before the pandemic hit. We have lower performance and proficiency at grades beyond grade six, even before that. Is this also a trend though, when you go back and look at your school district data, is this a trend that you see at your local district? Could this possibly present a risk to students completing high school? That's a big concern of mine. Math performance is an early indicator of high school completion success and high school dropout. Nationally, math was the tested subject that was predicted to suffer the greatest slide during remote learning and interruption to face-to-face -face instruction. Let's take a closer but different look at state level math performance data. This is just like the reading, grade levels down the left, the years across the top, and I've just, this is the data that fed those charts. But remember, they also missed a year without an assessment. So looking at the data here, it looks a lot different. Specifically, if you go look at the calculation in the percentage points cohort change on proficiency. When we take a look at cohort performance across tested years and factor in the skipped tested year of 2020 for all students, you confirm the cohort of students that had the greatest change in percentage points on math, they were fifth graders. You can see that. This is fifth grade. They had a 27.5 difference in change, and it wasn't the right direction. When... Uh, when you look at this though, through this lens, you also see that we have a great risk also with ninth and 10th graders from last spring. And those are our juniors this year. So I just wanna be able to show you as a board ways that you can look at your data, how you can put it in perspective to state performance uh, within your district. Uh, lots of rich discussions can come from examining and analyzing data and digging deeper to identify patterns within your districts your schools, and your subpopulations of students. So now for just a couple of communication and updates about ACT Aspire assessments, because there's a lot of discussion going on in, in our state right now. I thought it would be good just to put this out there and kind of help put a calm on it. Um, ACT Aspire Summative Assessment will be administered in the spring, this coming spring 2022. So that's what we need to be focused on right now is what do we need to do to accelerate learning between where we are now and where we need to be to help try to close those gaps that, that exist possibly in grade level performance. There is an option and it exists to administer the ACT Aspire Summative through the spring of 2023. Some of you may have heard of that, some of you may not. Um, ACT is, is basically no longer developing new items. So at some point in time, it will not be able to be uh, an administered assessment. But we as a state have an option to do it all the way through the 23 school year. DESI is currently researching options to replace statewide assessment and the timeline and plan for 2023 is still under development and it depends on procurement timelines. So DESI will share more information when the timeline is finalized, but I wanted to make you aware of that. We have an assessment that we can 
um, plan for. We know the structure of it. We know the subjects and the and the strands that we use in that, and that is coming this spring. There is the option that it would possibly go all the way into spring of 2023, but they have not finalized that timeline and procurement process yet to know that. The interim ACT Aspire assessments are not available. They were retired. Uh, they, they didn't perform on the new platform that they shifted to. So I really want to encourage you to make sure that in your local districts that you have found a way to secure local interim assessments to help inform teaching and learning. So you know where your students are and where you need to go and what their intervention needs are in grades three and up. The state provides one at K-2, and they also have funding to offset licensure costs through eighth grade this year if you do not have one. If ACT Aspire was your option and that is no longer available uh, for the interim piece, then you have an option to actually use another one of the four approved vendors. So now I'm gonna shift into the ESSA accountability reports. And like Scott said, the public release date is tomorrow. Um, schools have had an opportunity to do a private review of their data. They've had a chance to make appeals. So all of those things have transpired leading up to this public release date. I'm just gonna give you a high level overview of the index components that feed into that and the changes that you'll see in your 2021 reports. So ESSA, reminding us all, it's an acronym that stands for Every Student Succeeds Act because we're getting confused with all of our new acronyms this year again with ESSER and ESSA, but it's the Every Student Succeeds Act report. And again, tomorrow's the public release of the formal school index and the school rating reports. And you might think of those as the at a glance report. And just wanted to put over here really quick for you to see typically the components of the elementary, middle and a junior high are built this around this pie chart with this amount of weight. So you can see this is kind of a different takeaway that we shifted to when we went with, F, with ESSA. The greatest component in the school story or the school's ESSA index at these grade spans, elementary, middle, and junior high, are the value-added growth pieces. And that is huge because growth can be um, a lifesaver when you don't have the achievement piece in place as well. So these growth pieces are counted half of the ESSA index. 35% is the weighted achievement, which is based on numerous assessment, mainly ACT Aspire, but for your more challenged, uh, severely uh, cognitively disabled kiddos, we have like the DLM assessment. Growth, one thing that makes growth a little bit different, it's not just based on uh, student achievement from ACT Aspire, if it's also based on your English learner performance on the ELPA exam. And this other little green triangular piece is your school quality index. And that's one of, those are multiple measures that include um, reading on grade level, science achievement and growth, the student engagement, like giving points for students that do not have chronic attendance issues, and then if you're a junior high, on-time credits beginning at grade nine and ACT readiness, GPAs, advanced placement, concurrent credit points, those are all high school examples of school quality. The main difference between that sets high schools apart is part of their growth gets taken away so that graduation rate gets factored in. It all adds up to 100, but that's really the only difference there. And also the fact that they have a lot more measures that factor into uh, the school quality piece. So just to give you some updates that were shared uh, today at the state board meeting, despite the challenges of the past 18 months, these were the big takeaways that were shared out of the uh, reports before they're released. At a state level, they recognize that almost 12% of schools in elementary, middle, and high school grade spans improved their ESSA school index scores by 2.7, 2.3, and 1.75 score points, respectively, for their, for their all student population. So that's an achievement. Additionally, 13 to 27% of schools improve the ESSA school index scores when you look at their subpopulation performance. This would be like English learners or students with special needs, uh, poverty students. That's an example of how many schools were able to make an improvement for a subpopulation. 
On average, schools declined by 5.7 at the elementary, 5.1 and 4.11 score points for elementary, middle and high schools. So just to give you these numbers, um, and I'll share my presentation in the chat so that you have this information then to take with you. So the changes you need to know about, like Scott mentioned, uh, Act 89 suspended the school ratings, which is the letter grades this, for this current school year for 2021. The indexes are still there. The index uh, cut scores did not change. So you, if you need to, to look at that from the lens of what would that have been, you can still do that because you have the index itself. This is a big piece though that is impacted in some districts more than others. If the district tested less than 95%, then that weighted achievement denominator is going to be adjusted by taking the 95% of the number of students that were expected to test. Both scores will be put on that report and they will be there to highlight the importance of testing at 95% so that you know that you're actually looking at the data of the, of the school system itself. When reviewing unadjusted scores, when they're less than 95% of your student population that was expected to test, it is very important to keep in mind that the students missing from the test results and how these students' performance might have actually impacted the scores had they tested as expected. Last, I'm gonna shift into um, just a topic on digital equity that's new for this year. There are some data collection requirements and cycle reporting requirements. And I just kind of felt like this might be very important because it's, it's a kind of a heavy lift on school systems. The, the state has defined through partnership with CCSSO that digital equity is a measure of student access to devices and connectivity for participation in learning opportunities on and off campus throughout the school year. So schools are going to be charged this year to collect data and they have, it's pretty much left up to them how they do it and submit that data on each student through cycles through through seven during the school year with the final collection being done in June, which I think is cycle seven falls in June still. This data will help state and local districts determine where needs exist within schools, community, and state, but more specifically, which students, not what percentage of your kids had that, but which students specifically did or did not, and where does that uh, equity gap exist on which student. Information will assist in the development of state broadband initiatives, and it'll be reported to the U.S. Department of Ed by our state and appear on the school report card that comes out and I've referenced the commissioner's memo for you here. Um, knowing which students lack, this is some of the components that they're looking for that's gonna be collected. Knowing which students lack home internet access or a dedicated device will enable the district, the local district, to understand the impact it has had on learning outcomes and identify and call out that access gap as an educational equity issue target resources for the students in need of this access and to determine the most effective internet connectivity solutions. Um, it will also allow for districts to gain leverage when seeking funding to help close those gaps. And this is what the state will take away from collecting this data, understand the impact that lack of home access has on learning outcomes and actually provide them data to advocate for funding to close this gap and help direct the resources to the appropriate districts. Um, and maybe even engage with local internet service providers to develop and implement effective solutions, okay? 